All right, welcome back. In this next video, I'm going to talk about how we actually use options in the real world. So I'll start off talking about the differences between American and European options, and then we'll look at some options exchange exchanges, and then lastly I'll talk about how we use options as hedges. All right, so what is the difference between an American and a European option? Well, American options are options where you can exercise that option anytime on or before maturity. This is the case for most stocks or stock options where you can exercise up to the maturity date or expiration date. Uh, and this is in contrast with European options. European options are just a certain type of option where you can only exercise on the expiration date. You cannot ex exercise before that expiration date. Now, I don't want to get it twisted. Uh, American options exist everywhere around the world, not just America. European options exist everywhere around the world, not just Europe. Uh, I don't know exactly why we call them American versus European options, but basically American options, the big uh, benefit is you can exercise them before maturity. Okay, so what options exist around the world? Well, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but we do have stock options. Most of these are going to be American options. We have index options, again, American options. Uh, futures options, so options on futures contracts. We have currency options, interest rate options. Uh, all of these, you have a strike price. So in the case of stocks, it's the actual underlying stock price. In the case of, let's say, currency options, it's a specified exchange rate. Interest rate options, your strike price is technically going to be a certain interest rate, uh, and that's that. Okay, so how do you actually trade options? Well, options trade in the U.S. and Europe very much like stocks. I mean, we have several big exchanges that trade options. So we have the NYMEX, or New York Mercantile Exchange. We have the CBO, so Chicago Board Options Exchange, and Eurex, uh, so European Exchange. Uh, now, one other thing I should mention before I actually show you some of these exchanges, uh, options are typically traded in round lots, or lots of 100. So if you are a trader and you want to buy options, like call options, you're usually, the default is going to be you're buying options on 100 shares of stock at a time. Uh, most brokerage platforms let you go down to about 10 options or options on 10 shares of stock at a time. Uh, but I don't know which platforms allow you to go below that. Uh, I think all the brokerage platforms that I'm affiliated with or that I have an account with, uh, the minimum uh, number of shares that you can buy options on at a time is 10. Most traders that have American options, they will sell the option. They won't exercise the option. Why? Well, it's because during the lifetime of the option, as the option becomes more and more in the money, uh, the value of that option is going to rise. So you can actually sell that option for a capital gain. So this is normally what I do when I want to trade options. I buy it, wait for the price to appreciate because it's more in the money, and then sell it. Okay, now, uh, one final thing I should point out is that we do have a, uh, a specified term out there that you should be very familiar with. Uh, if you own the options but you don't own the underlying asset. So let's say you wrote some call options. You took the short position on some call options, uh, but you don't own the underlying stock. You would be said to be naked, or you would have naked options. Uh, it's risky for you because if someone exercises those options on the long side, you have to go out and buy those shares of stock so that you can uh, sell them to the person who has the, the long side of that option. Okay, so... Where do options trade? Well, options trade all around the world. Uh, so the CME Group is one of the largest options uh, exchanges around, or they run some of the biggest option exchanges around. Uh, so I wanted to show you that you know there are more than just stock options. There are things like crude oil options or uh, you know WTI options. So you can buy options on barrels of crude oil. Uh, so we can see the statistics on these down here if you want to. However, 
a large portion of stock options in the UI, United States are going to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange, or at least their options exchange. Uh, so we have uh, two broad options exchanges through the New York Stock Exchange, the American Options and NYSE ARCA uh, Options. And if you want more information, please feel free to take a look at this website. Uh, but just to give you a sense of how many options exist on a given stock, uh, these are the open options or the options outstanding along with the current uh, bid and ask price for Apple's common shares. So we have a bunch of different options, each with a different strike price. We know the bid price, so the highest bid price, lowest ask price. And we know the number of options traded and the open interest. So, num uh, yeah. So if I scroll down here, we will eventually get to the point where these options are have a strike price above the actual uh, share price. So that's right here, and we can see exactly how many options are traded. Uh, usually, the largest volume of options is going to be right around the stock price, or it is going to have a strike price right around the stock price. So that's what's happening here. But if you want, you can always look at these for more information. We'll use these in class as I ask you to actually price some options. Okay, so what else should you know about options? Well, first and foremost, options are one of the most popular risk management tools in investments. Uh, they are, I would say, one, I mean, downside risk is one of the most important uses of options. Uh, they, options, especially put options, they act as a form of insurance for individuals, it, put options will limit your exposure to declines in share prices of an asset that you own. Uh, so, you know, this is why we like them. Uh, so when you buy a put option, or as we call them, uh, protective puts, you're essentially locking in a minimum portfolio value because if the value of the underlying asset falls, uh, you just exercise your put and sell for whatever the strike price is. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. Uh, so this is an example where we have a protective put. Uh, so we've purchased a put price, uh, put uh, current share price at the time we bought this was $25. The purchase price of the put was $1.50. And uh, let's say the put has a strike price of 25. So let's take two scenarios. One where the stock price rises to $50 from 25. In that case, if we had 100 shares, the uh, total value of that portfolio would have increased from you know, 25 to 50 on 100 shares. So uh, the difference there is 25 times 100, so uh, 2,500, minus the cost of the put. So the total premium on these 100 puts. So 150 times 100, so 150. So our profit here is 2,350 if the price rises to $50 from a starting price of 25. Now, let's say we have scenario B, where the stock price falls from $25 to $10, but we still have the protective put with a strike price of $25. In this case, uh, our potential loss without the put is, you know, $25 minus 10 times the 100 shares, so minus $1,500. Uh, the value of the put right now is $15, because it's, it's $25 minus 10, you know, the strike price minus the uh, stock price. So again, $1,500, uh, less the cost of the put, so the total value of the premium, so $1.50 times 100 shares that we have the puts on, so $150. So grand total, our loss, if we have the put, is only $150 instead of uh, $1,500. So this is why we have puts. This is why we use puts. We use them to eliminate or uh, significantly reduce downside risk. All right, so... How can options mitigate firm risk? Uh, there are a lot of other ways uh, rather than just looking at stock options. Uh, the classic example, let's say that uh, we want to use call options to mitigate risk. Well, let's say we have a company like Delta, and a huge input cost for them is jet fuel, or we'll say you know, uh, oil for simplicity's sake. Well, what they can do is they can buy call options that will pay off if the price of a barrel of oil rises. So this helps them because if the price of oil, and therefore jet fuel, rises, 
uh, they have these options that they've purchased or taken the long position on whose value will also rise. So the call option increase in value will offset the rise in the price of jet fuel and oil. So in other words, they're using call options to offset the increase in the price of oil. Uh, another example of us using options to mitigate risk would be, let's say you have a corn farm, and they produce corn, they sell it at harvest time, but they're concerned that at harvest time, the price of corn will fall. One of the things they could do to eliminate or reduce that risk that they're going to have to sell their corn for a low price at harvest is buy put options. So they buy put options with a set strike price. Even if the underlying value of that corn falls below the strike price, they still have the put options that they can exercise and sell that corn for the higher strike price rather than the lower uh, uh, you know, price of, of corn. So this is how they would hedge against a downside, you know, downside risk. Okay, so let's summarize. Options can be written on many different assets. Uh, they can be used to hedge or speculate, although we talked about them being primarily used for hedging purposes. And, you know, put options are extremely, extremely valuable for limiting downside risk. All right, so with that, I'm going to conclude, and I will see you on the next video. Thank you.